What are the opportunities offered by digitalization for the future of work? In Taiwan, we have this national strategy called DG Plus or DIGI, where we break down the digitalization into four components. The first one, D, stands for development of infrastructure. The second is I for innovation. And the third is G for governance. And the fourth and the most important one to me is the second I for inclusion. Indeed, we have seen that digitalization have brought tremendous amount of innovation in terms of how we can move beyond the space and time boundaries and engage in work relationships with people who are in literally different time zones, who are working across many different disciplines, people previously constrained by their um, mental or physical handicaps and so on can be assisted by assistive technologies and integrate into a larger world-scale economy. So these are the opportunities. However, the opportunities are not without its drawbacks. For it is through algorithms and code, code of um, text, that's the regulations, and also code of machines, that's the um, algorithms, that regulates the intermediary relationships of those new configurations of work. And so, as with any algorithmic governance topic, we really need to hold two things to account. One is whether this digitalization platform for the future of work is aligned in its value with the workers. And the second is that if there is a mismatch in value alignment, can the workers take the means of intermediation to our own hands and in open source software, we call it fork, um, forking the intermediary platforms so that we take control of the platforms that dispatches the kind of communications and links offered by the internet. Indeed, the internet itself, as evidenced by the end-to-end -end innovation principle, offers precisely this kind of freedom. If you do not like any particular internet protocol and how it works, one can fork a different protocol without consulting or seeking permissions from previous attempts at decentralization. So the World Wide Web, for example, did not ask for permission from Gopher. Uh, and the newest iterations of, say, the Ethereum uh, distributed ledger did not ask for permissions from Bitcoin. And so this kind of value alignment and workers' control, I think, are the main opportunities as provided by an open internet in the governance mechanisms toward the future of work. In view of the imminent digitalization of broad areas of life, how are we preparing ourselves in the present for the future of work? So how would we make sure that the workers understand and is empowered when it comes to the value alignment as well as the fork, the capacity of forking of the working platforms. I think what's important is in our education system, we need to switch from a literacy point of view when it comes to digital media to a competence point of view. Whereas in the previous days of radio and television, it's just about one person speaking to many. Literacy was, of course, important back then. But nowadays, especially in Taiwan, where the broadband is a human right, anywhere in Taiwan, even on the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, you are guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second both ways for just 15 euros a month. Otherwise, it's my fault. And so because of this, we more and more see our students, our next generation, as producers of media and producers of source code and data. And in this sense, they are workers already and need to understand the ethics, the impact their work may have on the society. For example, about the fact-checking, about journalistic integrity and so on, because they are really the producers of both media and data. And so because of this, we made sure that, for example, when we're measuring the air quality using the air boxes, that's less than 100 euros um, per uh, sensor, each sensor installed in the balcony or in the school offers a concrete case 
uh, for the students to understand what does it mean to be a joint data controller? What does it mean for the GDPR requirements as applied to data? What does it mean to join a distributed ledger and how to hold the ledger to account? And so this kind of preparation, especially on the earlier ages of education, I think this is a, a really good chance for the whole society to look at the landscape of sustainability, the landscape of community development, and see that each of us can participate even just part-time as a part-time fact checker, as a part-time data contributor, and understand that in a liberal democracy, it's not just about uploading three bits of information every four years, which is called voting, by the way, but rather about day-to-day -day democracy and day-to-day -day solidarity when it comes to digitalization and upholding the good quality of life and good quality of decent work. What are the main challenges that workers, governments, specific sectors of society, as well as young people and older people, are facing in order to make the best use of the new conditions? In my personal opinion, the most important thing here is intergenerational solidarity. Whereas the younger people, the digital natives, understand the idea of worldwide connectivity and worldwide collaboration, the older people has the wisdom of making sure that the new ideas are feasible and could integrate with the social norms instead of disrupting the social norms in the name of innovation. So in Taiwan, we have this idea of reverse mentors, people who are under 35 years old joining the cabinet to reverse mentor the existing cabinet members who are often um, older than 35 years old. I'm 39 now. Um, so I work with my young reverse mentors who shows the direction of the uh, planet, who shows uh, where are we going uh, to make sure that there is intergenerational solidarity and the older people realize their ideas, making sure that there is sufficient resource and sufficient support and so on. So for example, um, the reverse mentor for the Minister of Labor proposed a couple of years ago that we need to attend the World Skills um, competition worldwide and highlighting the champions in the Taiwan National Day Parade, uh, just like Olympic athletes. Well, not only it's the case um, last year and this year, but also for future years, because people now understand that if we highlight the capacity of the world skills champion, it's not only bettering their individual careers, but also making sure that they can be introduced to the K-12 education um, curriculum and work with younger people, people who are even younger than they are, uh, and to build the community to make sure that there is a ergonomic, inclusive uh, park and uh, school buildings and um, all sorts of community development uh, targets, then the even younger people learn that there's a ladder of skills that they can work with those champions, have someone they can look up to, and then instead of just academic achievement, they can see it's actually those immediate um, solidarities across the various generations that can connect them all the way to the Minister of Labor, as well as our Premier, our Prime Minister. And so I think just showing this intergeneral solidarity is led by the younger people, I think this is one of the most important points in this new condition of intergenerational solidarity. How to ensure a collaborative and social economy in a context of increased digitalization? In Taiwan, we call it the social sector, the social sector. That is to say, instead of calling it the voluntary or the third sector, we recognize the social economy at its roots, the cooperative developments, the credit unions, the mutuals, and so on, um, as a legitimate sector in itself, helped by social entrepreneurs, helped by the not-for-profit local placemaking groups, the community colleges, as well as individuals that just have good ideas about how the society needs to organize better. And so just calling it a social sector, I think, 
have a truly collaborative uh, repercussion on the framing of digitalization. For digitalization is, of course, a technology or a set of technologies. But if we interpret technology only in terms of its business applications, that's to say the so-called private sector, then we risk only making investments on so-called Industry 4.0, which is fundamentally about the business interests, but not um, the Society 5.0, which is a Japanese uh, nomenclature to ensure that the social sector takes a higher version, a longer view, and a view based on wisdom of where those digitalization technologies should go. So in a sense, in DigiPlus, the development of infrastructure is just an instrument to serve, to foster innovation. And innovation is just to make sure that we have a good new cross-sectoral co-governance of the digitalization age. But this co-governance in turn must serve the value of inclusion to make sure that people are more and more collaborative across sectors instead of fighting old zero-sum games. We need to make sure through accountability mechanisms, through open innovation, through effective partnerships across sectors to build what we call trilingual, which is the cross-sectoral teams, for example, in our annual presidential hackathon. And then we choose five teams, five teams of social innovators, and our president gives the awards. There's no money attached to the award, but the award is a micro projector. If you turn it on, it shows the president promising whatever social innovation the team has done in the past three months will become national policy in the next 12 months. So this, I think, is the role of government in terms of strategies and public policies to promote digital inclusion is just by sharing the agenda setting power and empowering people closest to the pain. What is the role of platform cooperatives? How can the social and solidarity economy take better advantage of the current vertiginous process of digitalization? Platform cooperatives, for example, the open collective that I uh, have contributed to, um, or the Airbox that I just mentioned, uh, or the Circuplus platform, which just won the uh, presidential hackathon, one of the five winning teams, about making sure in a Pokemon Go-like game, people can go to the water refill stations instead of buying more plastic bottles. All this uh, shows that the solidarity economy is not necessarily based on any large scale top-down system that's kind of pre-designed a one-size-fits-all. Rather, it's more like a toolkit uh, where people with the idea of appropriate technology can at any given point appropriate that technology and fork it to fit the local needs. So I think the role of platform cooperatives is to be nimble, to be open, and to encourage forking, making sure that anyone who think that your idea is good can just take and fork and remix that idea and turn it into a local social innovation. Somewhat paradoxically, this is actually what some of the most international projects that I have contributed are done. For when we solved, for example, the mask rationing problem back in February this year, to make sure that more than three quarters of Taiwanese population have access to medical masks, we made sure that the people who distribute the mask are the local pharmacists that have the maximum trust and solidarity with the local communities. And the civic technologists, such as Howard Wu and Finjian Kiang from Tainan City, who built this real-time map availability technology, chose an open API and also open source way of making sure that people can, when they're queuing in line, with more than 140 different civic technologies to keep this uh, system honest and accountable. And then later on, because it's an open technology, people as young as 14 years old in South Korea managed to convince their government, first in the municipality of Seoul, to publish the availability of medical masks in the pharmacies in a similar way. And so the first map that works in Korea was actually written in Tainan City, even though Finjian Kyung doesn't speak Korean, he speaks JavaScript. And so this is how nimble 
that intergenerational and cross-sectoral and international solidarity can work on the current vertiginous process of digitalization. And if you can show that the common good is indeed realized on just your neighborhood, it will get picked up and it will get replicated and the social innovation will have a higher basic transmission rate than industrial innovation. What are the good practices of the social and solidarity economy in the creation and maintenance of decent work in a context of digitalization? I think the good practice beyond the freedom of forking and the value alignment of the algorithm, I think the third important part is that all the community members partaking in a co-governance need to make sure that they are truly stakeholders. We have seen many platforms ostensibly open, as in transparent and participatory, but the requirement of participation is so high, the um, specialized knowledge required so much that it is virtually just a few people, um, maybe five people, seven people, um, and most of them in the original founding team that can run this platform. And that, although if you look at the copyright license, if you look at the governing structure, it looks value aligned and it looks like anyone is able to fork on paper, um, it's not necessarily so in practice. So I think if we're making a decent work, especially around platform economies in a cooperative way, making sure that people can customize it without a lot of prerequisites training is very important. If we design our systems much like Lego blocks, such as the Sandstorm.io system that my office, pers I personally set it up for the office, the public digital innovation space, as well as anyone in the Taiwanese public sector to use. This allows anyone who come up with a small module, such as, I don't know, ordering lunchboxes together, to share the same cybersecurity, the same single sign-on, the same vetted um, way of trust of getting into a cybersecurity hardened uh, sandbox and share it with everybody we work with without um, any surcharge or without any um, administration by professional administrators. So this is what um, people in the software world call as citizen developers. If we adopt software platforms and open hardware that can cultivate this idea of citizen developers and citizen science, then the maintenance of decent work across those open platforms are virtually guaranteed. If on the other hand, only a few people understand exactly how the system works and the system was designed in a monolithic way that is virtually impossible for people to remix, then even though you can fork, you can't change it much. Even though it's value aligned, when there's more people joining the collective and the multi-stakeholder panel and forum comes with an evolved set of values, then you will find that you're constrained by legacy software. And so just making sure that the modularity is as important as value alignment, as well as the freedom to fork. Thank you for listening.